everybody. Welcome, welcome to Breen Club. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. Let me share screen and get us oriented. It's always easier said than done. Okay. Zoom motor planning. So I'm very excited about tonight's Brain Club. Um, I, I think you're going to like it. Uh, we're going to be doing our monthly book chat. Uh, tonight we'll be discussing The Rainbow Brain uh, by Sandy Menon. All right. Uh, so, well, well, a question. Yeah. I, yes. I can't find The Rainbow Brain anywhere but Australia. By, it's not yes, it's an Australian author. How did you get it though? It's not on Amazon UK or US? I ordered anywhere. it directly from her website. Oh, okay, um, got it. But the good news is that she is re gonna read us the whole book tonight. We're gonna watch like the, you know, so you're, you're gonna get to read it. Good. And we'll also put the link in the chat for anybody who would like their own copy. Um, here we go. So Brain Club, um, of course, as many of you are returning to know this is our education space to educate the community about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. This is not a support group, not for medical or mental health advice. This is for education purposes only. And you can participate however you are most comfortable. You can have video on or off. Um, and even if it, uh, even if you have your video on, we certainly don't expect anything of you. Um, you know what? Time out. I have to make, uh, I'm going to make Sarah co-host. Sounds okay. good. Cool. There we go. Perfect. All right. I have the kind of brain that it is, uh, it is, it is hard to speak and read and let in people from the waiting room. So anyway, welcome everybody. So um, all forms of communication are welcome here. You can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat. Um, and in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, it's really important to us that we cue safety by respecting and protecting the group's collective access needs. We do have direct messaging enabled. So if there's anything that you're uncomfortable for any reason, um, if you can send a direct message to Lizzie. Lizzie, did, are you around to wave? This is Lizzie, our education programs coordinator. So send a message to Lizzie who will see it a lot faster than I will if you um, need any adjustments made. All right, um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. You might not. Um, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. And you can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. Okay, and uh, it's my visual support to open the chat box so I can see it if you're using it. All right, so we're wrapping up. What up? Um, uh, uh, um, uh, our our month long conversation on interdependence, um, the idea of how normal and in fact required it is to rely on other people. Um, and we've talked about unlearning the myths of independence. Um, and uh, looked at interdependence in, in a lot of different um, settings. And tonight we're going to be, oh, time out, I'm supposed to make an announcement. Um, thanks for the visual support, Lizzie. Um, we are going to be doing a, sp every, every, every so often we do special programs during Brain Club that, you know, beyond regular Brain Club. Um, so the next time we're doing that is in September. So we just announced the other day, we're gonna be doing a webinar on our All the Things project, the Everything is Tech, Connected to Everything, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults, where we're gonna, we're gonna walk you through um, how, to, how, to, how to make use of the new resource that we just released to the world. Um, so um, Lizzie, if you can pop the registration link in the chat. Amazing, thank you. So that should be, that should be great. All right, so I want to tell you about our guest author who is joining us asynchronously because of the time difference. So Sandhya Menon is an autistic and ADHD psychologist based in Australia. Um, she is the author of two children's books, The Brain Forest, 
and the rainbow brain. And tonight we're going to have the, 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 the privilege of um, Sandhya reading us her book. Um, so Sandhya uh, has, has a, a, a psychology consulting practice. And Lizzie, if you can pop the link to her website in the chat, thank you, um, where she provides neuroaffirming accessible information for kids and families. So this book is amazing. Um, uh, as as Sandy describes it, it's about the marriage of autism and ADHD, um, which she calls a rainbow brain. Um, and um, you know, I, as someone who has both an autistic and an ADHD brain, um, sometimes it can be really hard to have a rainbow brain. Um, I have the kind of brain that needs sameness and novelty at the exact same time. It can be really exhausting to have a rainbow brain. And when Sandhya read me her book, I literally cried. It was the most affirming way I had ever seen autism and ADHD and their overlap discussed. Um, I learned something about my own brain um, in listening to it. And um, really, I think, I think, I don't know the rest of my sentence, but um, it's pretty powerful. Um, these were some comments um, from children um, about Sandhya's writings, um, and 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 in our pre-recorded interview, she'll tell the story of how she came to write these books. All right, and um, without further ado, we'll get right into it. So. David, take it away. And by the way, so this this um this pre-recorded interview and read aloud will run about thirty-ish minutes, um, and so we'll have the chat box going um, as we listen and watch. So I would just I would love to just hear your story. A lot of stories. Um, so a many. Bit stories. Of a storyteller, but I can go round and round. But. <laughs> Don't we all? Um, yes, I know. So I'll start. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning because that's yeah, wait. <laughs> that is the very way to start the story <laughs> from, the, from the beginning of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess I got into psychology because I had a really hard incident happen to me when I was 11. Um, I had a cousin who drowned and died. It was, so, was pronounced brain dead. But then we kept him on life support and, you know, we've continued going, which is wonderful. Um, but it was a really, really hard point in my life because um, I was 11. He was 18 months. So I was kind of looking after him. It was like that beautiful, like maternal cousin kind of vibe. <laughs> um, and that's when I had a lot of emotions and decided I wanted to be a child psychologist because I went to the library, I read all about emotions, what is going on with my body. <laughs> um, so that's what started me on this journey of wanting to help other children just understand what emotions are because I've been there, I understand how messy and complex that is. Um, what got me into the field of autism was another cousin of mine um, who was dying not diagnosed, but very autistic, <laughs> um, and recognized ADHD. Uh, and we were very close. And so I was like, well, I kind of get it. Like, I, I know what this is like. So I started, you know, when I was trying to get more experience, I started in the field of autism. I stayed there because I was happy. I got it. Um, and it was just such a great field to be in. And that landed into my eventual autism identification. <laughs> um, ADHD came first for me. I'm very like ADHD forward. Um, and interestingly, once I was medicated, that's when like more autistic traits started coming out. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of overwhelm because I'm like, wow, look, I can focus now. I can definitely do all the things. <laughs> um, and that led to a lot of sensory overwhelm and burnout. Um, and then I 
landed up at all give them identification one of the things that you know i'm really passionate about is making sure that we don't have to get there right i was at a point where i was just not even functioning in order to get my identification like i was throwing out from sensory like input i was autistic all along <laughs> but it was just not recognized and so you know we need to do more in our field to recognize happy autistics <laughs> um you know when we're just like stimming with joy and now i you know i advocate really strongly for the next generation seeing my son you know if i we, we had this thing i don't know if you've got it but where you drop the vitamins into the water, it comes as a little tablet and it fizzes. And to see him go, ah, you know, and just like really happy stims and understanding autistic joy is really nice. Um, so I, yeah, that's one of the things that I do now. Oh, and manage to summarize my whole journey, not too badly. <laughs> First off, I just want to acknowledge, like, like just I, the the unthinkable trauma that that you went through and how you tra transformed that to be able to to be making such an impact on the lives of children um that's just ah, i just want to acknowledge acknowledge all of, all all of that my goodness yeah. oh thank you so in the, uh, i'm from singapore and like how our family operates is you treat like your cousins as like your siblings right mm -hmm. so who i consider my immediate family like he's part of that um and you know at family dinners just to see him like screaming and crying and not really understanding why because we had no access to his inner world back then mm -hmm. so it was years so i think he only got a c when he was 16 years old and the accident was when he was 18 months <laughs> So it was a really, really long time of, I don't know, I'm just going to try to figure it out. It was very messy and muddy. And, you know, that's kind of how I grew up, us just trying to work it out, trying to be curious about what's going on. Um, so we weren't sure. <laughs> so now, you know, I work with a lot of distressed behaviours. And um, I get it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I could not agree more. I mean, DSM criteria for autism are autistic stress behaviors. And like, what would this look like to actually, for someone to be able to figure out their true self before reaching like such profound states of dysregulation? Yes, I know, wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> um, uh, as, as a psychologist, do you interface with colleagues from, the old way like do you like do you or, or have you like steered clear and you just do your own thing i always think you know i am really happy to chat if you're open to learning i'm not open to having an argument if you want to you know <laughs> argue with me on that and not take on the information that i'm presenting then that's a waste of my time yes yes who, yeah <laughs> who i am really open to is people who have had a little bit about, you know, what a neuroaffirming approach is, acknowledge that it is challenging and are ready to ask a question. And then I'm really happy to answer them and like to support them and try to identify, hang on, where's that niggly bit for you and how can I change that? Um, I'm really happy to do that. And I'm actually doing that in October, which is fun. So this is the story of uh, your becoming a clinician. Um, what's the story of you becoming an author? <laughs> uh, that is a really fun story. That is, you know, ADHD at the helm. Um, I just saw, I literally just had a client come in and ask me a question. And that question really niggled at me. <laughs> she said, some of my classmates don't understand, you know, my client or some of his classmates don't understand him, can you recommend a book for him to get up to the front of the class and talk to everyone about his diagnosis? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, no, I cannot do it that. It doesn't exist. 
Yeah. Yes. I mean, it exists. Resources like those exist. No, but, but they're not good. They're, they're not the messages that you would want to be out there to the class. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of, some of them are good, but it's just so my niggly bit is I don't think a disabled kid should have to, first of all, share his diagnosis if he doesn't want to, simply because it is bred out of ignorance of his classmates. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I think, you know, if he wants to share his diagnosis, he can. But it shouldn't be a mandatory thing. It shouldn't be, I have to tell you about my autism in right. order for you to be understanding and inclusive. Mm -hmm. um, I think inclusion should be at the very heart of our education. And we Amen. can support everybody to understand. I think, you know, on a classroom educational level, we should be talking about these differences and how they exist to make our classroom stronger. Yes. Amen. Um, yeah. So I would love, I would love to know um, how, when you talk about inclusion, um, what does inclusion mean to you? Yeah. Um, really good question. <laughs> um, and I saw, I saw a quote recently that really, really struck out me. It's, I think belonging is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And I don't think that's right. Um, so <laughs> because, you know, if you think about that party scenario, um, you can be asked to dance to it and they're like, wow, and I think this is what we're doing, right? We're saying, well, we're asking you along, we're including you, but we're not paying attention to the fact that you know, maybe it's still too loud. Maybe the party is actually still unwelcoming. Maybe I'm in overload. And so we do these basic things that go, well, I've asked you, I've made these things available, but we don't look at the barriers to accessing them. Amen. So I, I would argue that inclusion is being part of the planning. Yes. Um, right? It's having a say in how the party is conducted in the first place. Um, yeah, so getting to look at, okay, well, where are the safe zones? You know, um, how do I make sure that I have access to the things that help me? How can I make sure that, you know, the music's not too loud? Um, or, you know, go through periods where I feel safer. Those kinds of things, I feel like that is true inclusion. When we invite disabled people to have a say at the table, and for it to well and truly be heard, right? Amen. I am a, yeah, I'm a pediatric psych and I hear a lot of, well, we have a safe space in the back or we have fidgets in the room, like, but that's not, that's not it. Um, you can't just say, well, we have fidgets. Check, it's and, box checking. Exactly. Um, and, but if the child accesses the fidgets they're made fun of or, you know, Right. Because we don't have that fundamental layer of everyone is safe enough to use these accommodations yeah. to, you know, that attitude change needs to be present first, not just the, the boxes and the things. They, they hadn't changed their view of the world, which is that there's no right way to be a person. And if you, like, normalize that for four-year-olds, like, what a world we would have. Yeah. And, and you know, one of the things I really love about this book, and I don't know if you know um, Yale Clark, um, she emceed my, the launch of my brain first. And, you know, she read the book for the first time and she said, this book isn't just for children, Sandy. You know, this book was so healing for me to read. And, you know, what I love about them is they are just a really simple English way of kind of boiling down what we know in research, what we know in community conversations to something that's easy to read. It's quick. It's colourful and pretty, which I clearly like. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just a way of bringing joy. And that's one of the things I really wanted to do with these books is make something cool, you know, and just, not, you know, I didn't want to just like fiver it and 
have the book exist <laughs> you know and I, I said it had to be looking good so people could actually have a resource that they were really proud of um so I realized that when I read this book it's going to be like mirrored I don't know if you can change that but anyway I'll read it out so you can see the pictures cool okay well I'm glad that worked, that worked so this is the rainbow <laughs> brain it what it does is talk about autism and ADHD together in the same brain because you know so I wrote the brain first first when I was just identified as an ADHD and then by the time it launched autism came into the picture um but I wrote it as an ADHD and then when I was identified autistic I was like oh you know I don't know how these rules come together <laughs> that's really tricky and I thought you know what if if I have difficulty knowing you know which side like is autism dominant what things I do that are ADHD dominant and how I marry those two together um kids would have the same difficulty so that's what made the rainbow brain <laughs> but I'll read it I feel very much like this is story time everybody <laughs> I love it um great um so actually I want to read the dedication it says to all the amazing ADHDers who have told me that they have rainbow brains this this book was named by you and is for you thank you for always guiding me so what what a lot of children did after they read the brain first is they identified with so many things on different pages that they finished it and said i have a rainbow brain and i go well this is clearly <laughs> the next best you know it had to follow this is your rainbow brain so while the brain first is just talking about neurodiversity in general um the rainbow brain is especially for our neurodivergent people to see their brain represented um okay so i'll actually start reading <laughs> i have a lot of side quests in my brain okay <laughs> so deep down in the brain first i found a tree that looks like mine it wasn't like any brain i'd seen it had colors that swirled to combine let me see actually has so it's not just one solid color it's got a few colors going on this tree was a sight to behold with beautiful shades of blue but all mixed in with that there was some fiery red too fiery red this swirling whirling tree is called autism and adhd those are names for what it's like to have a brain like me um, and then you see over here, it's, it's ADHD and autism together. Blue and red, peanut butter and jam, butter and bread, mint and lamb. Yes, will they work together? Amazingly, they just do. Can we know them as one rather than as two? Peanut butter and jam was like my favorite sandwich combination. <laughs> um it gets purple we could be wonderful together and come to know this dance of how two seemingly opposing ideas can work perfectly given the chance so now we're going to some rules so autism i like to know what's coming up i feel great when things are the same i plan all the smallest details to keep stress out of my brain and then we have ADHD. I like life to be interesting and new. I feel bored when things are the same. <laughs> Details can matter or get tossed aside. Doing, doing what I feel is my aim. How do we marry those two together? <laughs> and you know, in the rainbow brain, I can deal with change unless a surprise you springs. Given choice, control, and time, I'm happy to do new things. And this is the ADHD network brain represented. It's lovely. Um, so ADHD, my brain likes to go fast, 
and do lots at the same time. <laughs> a little of this, a bit of that. How I get things done is mine to define. So, talking about affirming executive function skills. All right, we have a different way of getting it done. And then we have autism, like, and that's represented kind of more sequentially. It's like a cog. And it says, my brain needs to go slow. It takes its time to think. There are so many facts gathered to collect, process, and sync. So he's really talking about that detail orientation. Uh, I love this little magnifying glass. <laughs> um, so ADHD and autism. I learn best with preferred topics. My interest determines my speed. <laughs> when it's boring, though, I multitask to meet my needs. So we see, you know, a child jumping on a trampoline, um, a spin, a fidget. So it's just kind of nice to have, like, an ADHD culture represented in books. Um, and so this is the autism page. It says, my brain does not filter. Taking in most sights and sounds. Being in nature is lovely, but I need help in busy surrounds. So we say, you know, turn down the lights. We can use noise cancelling headphones. Or we can, you know, advocate and ask to meet in a quiet space. So, you know, come with me. I can't go there, but you can come here. And ADHD, my brain thinks everything is important. <laughs> I pay attention to it all. <laughs> it's easy to forget what is said. I use strategies to help my recall. One instruction at a time, sit closer to the teacher or I make it visual. I draw and write it down. Um, and this is one of my favorite, um, this is talking about our emotions. <laughs> It's just kind of, you know, all the high highs and news, but the yes and the smileys, but also just the hang on, we need to slow down. We need to just kaboom. <laughs> um, so this is the best way that I can represent our emotions. Um, we engage the world with the world so deeply. Our highs are high, our lows are low. However I am feeling, I allow myself. I learned to go with the flow. So really thinking about our compassion for ourselves and accepting where we are. Um, now these colours are swirling to get that are swirling wet together, don't you see? Want to know another little secret? There may be more colours in your tree. <laughs> um and then we have this the real rainbow brain. You know, let's talk about acid and intellectual disability and anxiety and PDA and Tourette's and OCD and giftedness and, you know, all our learning um, challenges. So dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, you know, talking about it's not just autism and ADHD. It's very rarely occurring by itself. Um, but let's learn to look at ourselves more holistically. Um, this is, there are so many different trees and a few of them are rainbow. So here we kind of come back to that brain first concept of, you know, this is dyslexia, there's neurotypical brains, there's people who are just autistic or ADHD, and then we've got our rainbow brain. We've kind of added those few more colours in there now. I'm learning more about my brain type. And with the right supports, I grow. So here are some people that help nurture rainbow brains. We're kind of talking about why we see people. Right? We have our parents. We have an occupational therapist. We have counsellors, animal therapists. We have our teachers, psychologists. That's me. <laughs> um, you know, we have support workers who might come. Um, speech pathologists and art therapists. So really trying to represent you know, some of the people who we might see. Um, talking about here are some things that can hurt rainbow brains. Loud noises, bright lights, too many things to concentrate on, having to sit still for a long time. You know, 
<laughs> I'm fidgety. I need to move. <laughs> um, a sudden changes, rejection, feeling misunderstood, and ignoring our body signs. Actually, being made to really. <laughs> um, and here are some things that help rainbow brains. So we we have like self advocacy. I need to play by myself today. It's okay, sure. I'll see you later. Right. And you know, just having that connection because this is something that I used to do at school. I never played with my friends all the time, but they always got that we were still friends. I, I like to do my own thing a lot of the time. All right. So here are some things that help rainbow brains. Resting when we need. Um, my son came up to me the other day and said, well, I'm feeling very tired because it's the first week of school and I need to cancel my after school activities. <laughs> I'm like, great. <laughs> I love that you're telling me this and articulating it. <laughs> um, a sensory accommodation. So using what we need. We have safe and sane foods. And I had to draw chicken nuggets. <laughs> In this, like this is what he actually comes to. I love nuggets, and it like actually says, I love nuggets. <laughs> I do love nuggets. <laughs> I'm asking for what we need, learning about ourselves, time in nature, time with our interests, and meeting others with rainbow brains. This is all my recommendations <laughs> usually in reports. <laughs> And I really wanted to give a nod to, you know, we can celebrate Rainbow Brains, but at the same time, talk about how it is a disability and it is really hard. Um, so I depicted it this way. It says, having a Rainbow Brain is special, but the world can be hard to navigate. See, it wasn't built for Rainbow Brains. There are still changes we need to create. It's tiring moving through this world. And we need more time to rest. Making space for self-care and the things we love help us feel at our best. So, just chilling out. <laughs> um, because now we know, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> um, now we know what works for the rainbow brain design. Go build a wonderful life and shine, shine, shine. And that's it. And then I've just kind of got some other terms in further reading if anyone wants to learn more about it. That's the rainbow brain. I don't even know what to say. Like, I just feel so incredibly honored to have to have you read this to me. Like, it's one thing for me to have like read it on my own, but to have you read it to me, like, this is like, I think I like this is <laughs> anyway, I just anyway. Like, but people, people want to reduce down to like, well, this is my autism and this is my ADHD. Anyway, like this was just such a beautiful, like even like the, 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 the metaphor of color, like, of course, red and blue can become purple. Of course they can. Like, ah. and, yeah. and, and I appreciate like all of the little details that went in to just even even what you chose to show as images um for these concepts We're just just i am i am blown away this is this is just beyond anything this is incredible. thank you that's so nice i'm so happy yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, no that's very kind of you you know i like where am i creating this little room um it's just looking at how we represent our culture and it's so so nice when that kind of lands with someone else too all i think about is you know first of all me like what do i love i love nuggets i love fidgets and, you know, <laughs> and then kind of putting that in place so the end product is something that i'm really really happy with and when someone else sees that as well they're like oh, i love nuggets too i was like you have no idea how much i love nuggets <laughs> i love nuggets so much yes i know yes. Um, and you know, I was going through a really tough year last year with um, sensory input, particularly around food. And you know, I would have food cooked for me, so I couldn't even cook, but I would have food cooked for me and it'd be, you know, a balanced meal. And I'd look at it and I just couldn't eat it. And my mm -hmm. husband would look at me 
And now he's learned without judgment to just go, do you need nuggets? <laughs> just so you can eat, you know? And I'm like, thank you so much because I can't handle this right now. I know that, you know, this food provides nutrients and nutrition, but right now I need to eat what I can eat. Um, and it's not that plate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my husband hasn't figured that out yet. Um, but, uh, yeah. yes, that resonates with me a lot. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, the nuggets of bringing us together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a, so my, my up to nuggets is, uh, is, is French fries. And so mm. that's, that, that was my dinner tonight. So it was, uh, yeah. 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 Um, can I, sure can I tell you a little bit about my favorite chip? I have to. Yeah. 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 Sorry. There is this um, a chain in Australia that exists. I don't know outside, but it is. They've thought about their chip design so much, and it's actually it's not square. It is diamond shaped, so that the inside is fluffy and the outside like crisp. It's like I love it. I said you have like thought scientifically about how to create the perfect chip, and the seasoning is so good. Oh, that's amazing. Like, well, that's too. so interesting. You're making me think about like the physics of chip design, which I'd never thought about. Like that's why waffle fries are so much easier to cook. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> thoughts. Um, this is amazing. Um, amazing. The science of our food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious what um, how old is your child before I asked my, I was going to ask you, like, what, what, what does your child think of your books? Oh, six. Are, um, are children the same age? Yeah. Um, so he actually helped me create the brain trust when he was four, which is amazing because, you know, it was created in lockdown and I had him by my feet. <laughs> I go, well, I really need to try and get this out. Why don't you draw this idea? And he drew the first sketches and I just sent those sketches to my graphic designer as a turn this into something. And it's nice to see the translation. Um, yeah, no, he's very proud of me. He Shortly after I learned that I was autistic, I, I, I too, um, ADHD came first and then, um, uh, you know, I, anyway, um, so um, drove myself into burnout um and was also like i also had this i had a job that was really ruining my life and that further drove me into burnout and um you know all of that anyway so um got really bad had a i'd never i mean I, i'm more of a i'm a meltdown dysregulated person not a shutdown and i reached a point of dysregulation I had never reached before. And I lost the ability to speak. I didn't leave my chair and like, didn't leave my room. Anyway, it was like a big, anyway. And then finally, thank God for my rainbow brain, um, that I conceived of my nonprofit organization. And that was what pulled me out. And, um, it was uh, um, a, 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 a big scramble. To... And then my then four-year-old was also sitting at my feet. And I gave her uh, the outline of a brain, like to like color, like just color while I'm like researching electronic medical records and stuff. And this is what she made. Oh. That's lovely. It's very pretty. <laughs> Thank you. So she colored a rainbow brain, which we drew a house around and we made it our logo. Um, but I so appreciate. I just I, I I really appreciate the opportunity to hear to hear your story and your journey and thank you for sharing your beautiful book, not just with me, but with the world. It's so incredible. I mean, this is I mean, when you when you when you think about the opportunity, I mean, like when, when you said that people, adults have shared with you that reading the brain forest was healing. I mean, that this, even, even I spend my whole day thinking about the marriage of autism and ADHD. Um, even for me, 
um, I have new insights that I about my own brain that I didn't have until yeah. you said it. So anyway, um, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. That's all right. That's so lovely. I love that. You know, it's, um, it's so amazing to hear like how this book kind of travels and connects people. Um, so in Melbourne, we had, so I wrote the book in, um, in during lockdown. I mean, you know, was, <laughs> we couldn't see people and I was just kind of needing a creative space and out, um, outlet. And I lost my train of thought. This is fun. <laughs> I get it. I do. Um, oh, yes. So what we had in Melbourne, we had a really, really long lockdown. It was 288. 282 maybe days in lockdown and there was a rule which you couldn't travel outside of your five kilometer radius so you just had to stay within your neighborhood and that would enable you to get your essentials and things like that so when i first sat down and predicted where it might go i was like maybe i'll go like across the bridge type thing you know in Melbourne, I was like, if it reached to the other side of Melbourne, that would be great. <laughs> that would be, you know, my happy place where people all around Melbourne have had it. And now we're talking to people all around the world, which is amazing. I would, um, I, ha I have no words really. Um, I, I feel so privileged to have heard Sonia's story and have her read this book to us and share it with us. And yeah. So I would love, love to hear any, any other reflections that anyone else has to share and Sanja's going to watch on the going to watch the recording when when the when uh when it's available and Lizzie's putting in the chat um the social media links if you want to connect and maybe um Lizzie can we maybe post um like website again and stuff because that was like that was so earlier in the chat We'll, we'll put websites, book links, social media handles. Marie. Oh, I'm, you're still muted. There you go. I know. I'm like clicking, <laughs> trying to find the unmute. Hi. So this is actually my first All Brains Belong, and I'm very excited about this. Um, this book. Wow. Um, I feel like, like I'm going to probably be processing all of this like all week long <laughs> actually i have therapy tonight so maybe i'll process that with her <laughs> but what a wonderful way because i think so often we see representation of whether it's autism adhd or both together we see the representation of the struggles but not necessarily like the the balance and that inner conflict that's not always negative but it's it is a conflict of interests essentially and i i love that um i just got my identification officially for both and i'm very excited about it so this was just such a wonderful thing and thank you so much for uh yeah sharing this what a wonderful time thank you Gong. yeah i think you're absolutely right i think especially and it, it, honestly i think it's the healthcare system's fault um be, be, because um autism and adhd are most typically discussed through a deficit-based lens you know the listing of this of, of, of stress behaviors um of course of course we hear that more than just even even neutral we don't even often hear about neutral let alone joy Yeah, I 100% I agree. I loved that. That's a good way to put it is that there was the neutral and the joy in this book. And I just really, I don't have the words. I don't have the words. It's beautiful. Right. 
I also really appreciated um, the, the, the part of the book where it, um, Sonia talked about how like, yeah, there's, there's hard parts. Things are really hard. Um, and with an emphasis on the, the, how hard it is, is relative to how many barriers there are in the environment. And that's what we, of course, we talk a lot about that at Brain Club. Welcome anyone who's not had a chance to share yet anything that, that you'd like to share. Welcome back. Hi, Mel, I have a question. Hi, Cynthia, go for it. <laughs> I was struggling with the typing. Um, so it seems like the DSM-5 keeps kind of changing a bit is that right or are they as as more information comes tr through is um because i'm feeling like um especially when i was going through the diagnosis for my daughter it was like she was kind of on the edge of autism adhd but then again listening to the story she's definitely both but She's not being classified as autistic because like, honestly, I think it has to do with budget. It's not really like, I think it's kind of icky, like the school system. Um, and then I was also thinking about my ADHD and listening to the description in this children's book. And I now I'm thinking, rethinking my diagnosis. So it's like, how, how true is this kind of, formula that they have for for saying okay you're on this like where's that little gray area or are you on this side are you on this side are you just adhd are you you know are you also autistic like that it feels very gray to me so thanks for naming that cynthia what i would say is that what we're really talking about in in, in neurological based differences um, that, that, that aren't disorders. They shouldn't even be in the DSM. And um, what we'll put in the chat, Lizzie, can you post the link for the stigma of autism talk from April? So this is a, um, I, several of you have been there. Every April we give an annual talk um, about the healthcare system and perpetuating the stigma of autism. And um, I include going through the history of how autism got into the DSM and the history of how the language changed over time. Um, it's the story of corruption, really. Um, and it's, it's pretty disappointing and was certainly not part of my medical training. Um, I didn't learn that history until I learned I was autistic. And Autism became my monotropic focus. Um, and I learned all kinds of things. Um, but but I think like big, big picture point is that um, uh, we're really talking about the DSM-5. Um, it's not based on additional information that's acquired. It's, it, 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 it's, it's just a description of stress behaviors. And so all too often people don't receive an autism diagnosis and, um, you know, uh, self-identification is completely valid. That's my professional opinion. Um, and I think that, um, not only are there like barriers, barriers, like, you know, cause like people charge cash and there's all kinds of things and all kinds, all kinds of, I have a big PDA response to that, like whole scene. Um, but, but also, um, 
many professionals are trained in that deficit based lens and that's that's all that's it's 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 part of the the whole it's it, it's a big part of the problem sarah thanks for rescuing me as i was not actually going to wind up without the visual prompt like stop talking oh, so. oh you're you're doing great um you're doing great um i think just in, if we can just zoom out a little bit on the dsm um, when you, if you look at the DSM and you, you, and and you, you look at when the DSM explains the theory, its own theoretical basis, what it basically says is that what it is, it, what it, how it basically defines a disorder, is as something that um, irritates your family or your community, and makes it difficult for them. And so it's based, it's they, they haven't actually done the research to say what is good for human beings. They've just basically said well, my culture accepts this or my culture doesn't, or my family or my, or my family accepts this or my family doesn't. And so it's, it's very much a, um, it's, it's a, it's a book that's, that's really, the, the definition of disorder is really problematic because it's not, it doesn't, there's no science based on like, is this good for human functioning or not? It's just, it's, it's, it's irritating for the, the, the basis for a disorder is it's irritating for other people in the culture. And and so, it, like, and it doesn't mean like if you have if if you if you have an autism if you have a quote unquote autism dis disorder, um, or or any other thing, of course you need help. Of course your parents need help because you've got an entire society that's discriminating against you, and that's making your life difficult because they do things differently, which you can expect based on the way that that natural diversity works. I mean. Natural diversity, the normal curve says, you know, 64% of people are going to be within a normal range. And then some of us are going to be a further a bit further out there. And then some of us are going to be way further out there. And, and it, it's not a bad thing. It's, 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 it's how Nate, it's how like evolution hedges their bets against really bad things happening is to have a whole, whole range of diversity. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll shut up there, but it, it, it just, it's, of course, pe parents need help. Of course, people need help. It doesn't, but it's not a disorder. It's like we need people need compensation to help for the way that majority culture doesn't want to change and does not want to the and the the, the way that majority does, the culture does not want to change and it does not want to um uh, uh does really prefer, likes to wants to just keep doing business as usual. Um, and in a way that uh, that shuts other people out. Yes. Until yes. they need us, and then until they need us, and we become heroes, and then they and then and 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 then we go back to then then they go back to business as usual and throw us out as soon as they don't again. <laughs> you, Sarah. There's a lot of feedback in the chat. Um, I could not agree more. Um, I could listen to you talk all day long, um, and I could not agree more. And I think, um, and as a comment Sierra shared that I think is also really important to add, when you zoom way out and you think about all of the, um, the, the oppressive power systems, all the isms that all go together, racism, ageism, ableism, all the isms, um, what, what Sierra's pointing out about the affecting your ability to be productive in school or work as a defining characteristic of most all disorders in the DSM, right? So. The, this, this this is all embedded in power systems where when, when we start talking about groups of people um, in terms of measuring their value according to what we produce, um, that's gross. That's just so gross. Um, and I think that's why we have so many adults who are needing to unlearn those narratives. And that's certainly one of the functions of Brain Club is to collectively unlearn that narrative that says that you your value comes from what you what you produce as opposed to who you are. I guess it's just frustrating because you know that the dollars that she's going to need to get through are directly linked to all of this. And <laughs> you're, you know, you're one person against this whole system. And it's yes. really talking about in 2023, um, we don't have universal design 
in most contexts and places. Um, but, but that's why so often at All Brains Belong, we speak about neuroinclusion. We speak about, um, and like, you know, when I do trainings for healthcare providers or employers, like I'm not talking about this is what you do um, for those for those people who may or may not be autistic or ADHD. Like this is what you do to create spaces and cultures for people with all types of brains to thrive. Um, because it would be really um, like, like the, the fact that you need um, a medical person to label a thing that's not a disorder with a diagnostic label that they don't actually understand that is based on stereotypes and um, a narrative that, you know, was created in the 1900s and is still here and is not based on the scientific understandings of autism, um, that you need that in order to get a level playing field is just wrong. And as Monique says in the chat, the DSM arose in the same era. So, so you're, 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 you're right. So, so when, 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 we, when we talk about, you know, all of the health inequities and all of the, like the impact of all of, all of the ways in which, you know, humans are othered, um, you know, for, 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 for race, for gender, for sexuality, like, and, you know, think about, think, think about even the evolution of the DSM in terms of like, you know, sexuality was like, you know, just the, the, the DSM is supposed to evolve. And this, I'm hopeful that one day will also evolve. Just, just to the person who's just a comment, I just really want to acknowledge, um, and I forgot your name, but the, the person who's talking about their daughter, and of course, I mean, as a parent, it's heartbreaking, and you think your, your kid, yes, your kid is going to need all sorts of funding and all sorts of support to get through, and 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 go for it, and in and, and, and whatever way you can get them, whatever diagnosis or whatever funding you can get them, like, absolutely go for it, and at the same time, like, climate change, brought to you by mainstream culture, uh, you know, um, insurrection, brought to you by mainstream culture. Uh, you know, a, a bunch of other crap brought to you by mainstream culture. You know, mass shooting brought to you by mainstream culture. So, you know, the so the so the fact that so all of this stuff that they're you know all of the the funding you're getting is to make your kid that to, to make your kid fit better into mainstream culture, which is creating all sorts of fun, effing pathology that that for the for their, uh, for uh, both in. It's a culture which is creating a, a pathology laden culture and killing the planet. So, you know, please hold it with a grain of salt, too. I mean, that that's that would anyway, that's that's my both and perspective. Amen. And um, when we think about, um, you know, what, what what is one of the things that that we can do now is, um, you know, teaching teaching kids about their brains and we all have different brains we all have different brains that learn think communicate differently oh. when we have certain patterns of differences we sometimes call it things that's all um and you know i i i i i think that um this i've really appreciated this conversation um and i think it it also sets us up to bridge to next month's brain club topic um, we're going to be revisiting the double empathy problem. The double empathy problem is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who's an autistic social scientist in the UK. Um, so this term was coined um, uh, decades ago, referring to the fact that it's not that there's one normal type of social skills or thinking skills, and then, then there's autistic people. It's that when there's a mismatch of worldview and communication style, that is where misunderstandings happen. Um, and that um, autistic pe autistic people um, communicating with other autistic people um, th that's th that 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 goes well and um, uh, non autistic people um, struggle to perspective take autistic people um, just as much in the other direction and so here we have a um, a medical system with a narrative that like doesn't say that. It's that there's normal, a normal social set of social skills, a normal way of interacting. Um, uh, we, we, we did a group medical visit last night. We were look, look, looking, at, looking at this and like, it's gross. You read these criteria and they're just gross. Um, and um, I think the double empathy problem 
um, is is something that um, you know allows us to understand all that goes wrong in healthcare, in education, at the workplace. And so um, we, we hope you'll join us uh, next Tuesday. We'll talk about the double empathy problem. We're going to talk about the double empathy problem in relationships next week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Bye.